After one day of spring training with the whole squad there, Adolis Garcia is convinced that this Ranger team is going back to back. And on today's show, I'm talking about exactly why he's completely right. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 10 seasons, including all five as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, but before we get into today's episode, the show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join the day you can get 150 in bonus bets if your first bet of five dollars or more wins just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started now here we are one day in the books full squad workouts were on monday the gang's all here and the rangers are finally back the reigning world series champs are in camp, seeing all the pictures of everybody working out, seeing Wyatt Langford in actual Rangers gear, not just Round Rock Express gear or Rough Riders gear or Hickory Crawdads gear or whatever they wear in the Arizona Complex League, seeing him in actual Rangers spring training gear, taking BP with the big boys, oh, it's just a beautiful sight. Everybody in camp feeling good about being on the reigning world champs, especially Adolis Garcia, coming off signing that two-year extension with all of those fun modifiers that could take it up to 20 and a quarter million dollars, depending on where he finishes in MVP voting. He's feeling good about himself. The Rangers are feeling good about themselves, and the wonderful, joyous, 18 million megawatt smile of Adolis Garcia completely lit up the Rangers complex yesterday at spring training, where... He's not just thinking going back-to-back is a possibility. He's not saying, eh, it's possible. We're going to try and, you know, hedge our bets and and do our best just to, you know, see what we do the best we can in the regular season and and try and get into the playoffs. And then once we get to the playoffs, we'll see we're going there. Adolis Garcia was hedging nothing. He said when asked about if the Rangers could repeat as World Series winners, quote, we are going to do it again, end quote. No hedging bets, no ho-humming, no nothing about it. This is going to happen. He knows this team is good enough to do it. And they have all the confidence in the world in themselves because they literally just did it. Granted, there are some subtractions from this team, mainly Jordan Montgomery. Um, He hasn't officially left, but every single day that he does not sign with the Rangers feels like another day he gets further and further away from coming back to the place where he helped bring a title to Arlington for the first time ever. But hey, this team is still plenty good. This lineup is still incredibly good. And Adoles Garcia is still the heartbeat of this team. He is the emotions. He is the emotional leader of this squad of a team that is filled with a lot of Pretty quiet, pretty reserved guys, not very animated. Uh, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, not the loudest, most vocal leaders, not the most emotional and, and fiery guys, but Adolis Garcia is the emotion of this team. He is their heartbeat. He is the heart and soul and lifeblood of this team. And when he gave that speech before Game 3, after he went down with an injury in the World Series, he lit a fire under everybody. I mean, watching what he did in the ALCS throughout the postseason, in that World Series Game 1 where he won it for all of us with that walk-off home run that no one will ever forget. We watch at least every single day, at least at least once a day, or at least maybe that's just me that watches that home run almost every single day. But it kind of sparks a fire under you that these guys aren't satisfied with just one. I mean, me personally, I'm I'm mostly satisfied with one, but I would like another. And this team does not have the same mentality as those of us lifelong diehard fans who were heartbroken 
jaded, so angry and bitter about baseball for so many years because of all the heartbreaks that we had suffered that were cured immediately on November 1st at 10 p.m. Central Time in 2023. All that was cured. But this team, it wasn't just that it meant the entire world to the fan base, this championship run and this championship and being reigning world champs. It wasn't just for us. It meant everything to this team as well. One of the things that Adoles Garcia talked about when he spoke with the media on Monday is that, you know, this team is is more like, you know, a, a group of friends than it is a team of, you know, co-workers, which for most of last year and most of this quick turnaround rebuild, it kind of felt a little bit like a band of mercenaries. It wasn't a bunch of homegrown players who had been here for five, ten years and, you know, gutted it out through the rebuild. It was kind of a lot of mixed match pieces, parts, guys who, you know, the the long-suffering ones were pretty much Adolis Garcia, Jonah Hyman, Nathaniel Lowe. I mean, Jose Leclerc had been here for a long, long time, but he had gone through a bunch of different eras. He was one of the few players who had been here for actually an incredibly long time. And then Martin Perez had been back for a couple years, suffered through some early losses, and even got to see the glory of the 2015 and 16 Rangers that was an incredibly good team. But other than that, it didn't feel like there was a whole lot of camaraderie. It didn't feel like this was a group that was incredibly tight-knit, that was you know best buds hanging out off the field, and, and that was fine. They were a good baseball team, and they didn't need to be more than that. And, you know, they still don't really need to be more than that. But hearing from Adoles Garcia and, and hearing, you know, the vibes around this team when they talk to the media, when they, they you know, are showing up in spring training and, and how they, you know, how they vibe off of each other, it it has kind of a different feel than than we thought. This isn't a band of mercenaries anymore. This is a tight-knit group of going through the hardships of last year, going through the insane ups and downs of the regular season, and, well, not so much downs in the postseason, just the ALCS was the only, you know, downer moments in Game 2 of the World Series. But other than that, this team just rode like a firecracker through the playoffs and didn't face all that much adversity outside of that one series in Houston where they won every single game in Houston and beat their division rivals to go to the World Series and win their first ever World Series. But there were so many highs and lows throughout the regular season. The Jacob deGrom injury, the Corey Seager injury, the second Corey Seager injury, the Jonah Heim injury, the Josh Young injury, the Adolis Garcia injury, the Max Scherzer injury. I mean, it was insane the amount of injuries that this team suffered. Not to mention the horrific losing streak at the end of August, not to mention the absolute catastrophe of a home series in September against the Astros when they're trying to hold them off and hold on to that division crown for dear life, and not to mention the last week of the regular season where there's still some thought that this team might end up missing the playoffs despite having an incredible series and having a season and having a chokehold on the AL West crown for the vast majority of this season basically basically till the halfway point of August but this team rallied through it this team banded together and even though there are a few guys who are not on this team that were members of the 2023 squad the squad that's here is pretty much that same team that went through all of those hardships all of those battles all of those struggles all of those we're so back it's so over moments This is that same squad. And while maybe this 2024 squad, hopefully, hopefully crossing my fingers that it won't be as up and down of a regular season as it was last year, because I don't know about y'all, but that that did a number on my heart. It might have taken a few years off my life with how incredibly stressful the entire back half of that regular season was and the postseason as well. But those bonds, those experiences, that gets to carry over. This is still that team. Granted, it's not exactly the same team that won the World Series. But the lineup is almost incredibly the same. 
it's basically just a DH that's being replaced in Mitch Garver. So long, farewell, happy trails to him. But then you add in this young prospect in Wyatt Langford, who might end up winning the favorite, winning the job out of camp to be the DH. You add that kid who's hungry for a championship, who didn't get to be here, didn't get to win that World Series, and is generally regarded as one of, if not the best hitting prospect in the entire minor leagues. You add that to this lineup that's already hungry and ready to go back to back and is already being overlooked and doubted, people forgetting about that championship that happened three months ago, man, that is an incredible combination. And it's why I think Adoles Garcia is absolutely on the money that this Rangers team is going to go back to back as champions. Come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the strength of the depth of this team, a little bit about Corey Seager and his spicy comments when he's going to come back, and a little bit about some roles in the bullpen. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Shout out to the everydayers for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day. On tomorrow's show, I'll be talking about Jonah Heim, his importance to this lineup and this team, and why he is so unbelievably, incredibly valuable. Now, let's look at the depth of this lineup. This is the depth of this team in general is such an incredible strength for this Rangers squad. Specifically, the bench depth of this team is really darn good. And the main reason for that, not just Travis Jankowski, not just Wyatt Langford being the probable fourth outfielder. But a lot of it comes down to Ezekiel Duran and Josh Smith. Now, the left side of this Rangers infield is going to be on the shelf for a little bit. Josh Young is missing time with that calf injury, and Corey Seager is still recovering from that sports hernia. It has been three weeks since he had surgery on that sports hernia. It did not heal up like he was anticipating, so surgery was the last option, and that is the option that the Rangers and Corey Seager decided to go with. He is still almost certainly pretty probably going to be ready for opening day right now since it has been three weeks. Usually, the recovery time is about six to eight weeks before guys start participating in games. So if it, if it is the eight-week mark post-surgery, that is when he starts participating in games again, that will be about 10 days before opening day. So even giving a little bit of buffer time for him to be fully ready, it should be the Rangers' initial level of concern being very minimal whenever he did have that surgery. It seems like it's still pretty minimal. He's still... You know, hanging around, um, doing some light activities, still not quite sure on the timeline of when he's going to be ready to come back, but he is doing everything he can to be ready for, at the very least, opening day. Probably playing some spring training games at the very, very end of spring training. I'm thinking that is the goal. Just playing a couple of spring training games and then um, be ready to go. As for Josh Young, it is still going to be a little bit of time before he is ready. Hopefully he will have a with significantly more spring training games than Corey Seager. Hopefully, this spring training injury doesn't end up going into the regular season. Hopefully, he is still able to participate, come back in the two- to three-week timeline that was initially anticipated after suffering that calf injury on what I believe was his first day at spring training taking grounders, which is... Uh, just an absolute bummer. Talked about that on yesterday's show and Josh Young's bad luck. But the Rangers don't really need to do much in terms of panicking and looking for somebody else to come in and step up in case those injuries end up taking a little bit more time than they initially anticipated. Even if both those guys miss, say, 
a week or five days or three days of the regular season, the Rangers are in an okay spot to where they don't need to go out and sign anybody, really. I mean, their roster is is so good, and having Josh Young and Ezekiel Duran as your backup infielders, having both those guys, you're in a really solid spot. Then the depth behind them, if they need somebody else, is, well, it's probably not going to be a lot of Justin Foskey playing on the left side of the infield, even though he has taken some grounders there. But you have Jonathan Ornelas, who is a World Series champion with his, what, seven career plate appearances in the big leagues, still gets a ring, still counts, and still a solid, yeah, seven at-bats in his major league career. Does have a hit, a couple of runs scored, um, but is solid. If that's your third bench shortstop slash infielder, that's your third option there, who is going to be on the 40-man, who is probably not going to make the opening day roster, but if that's your third option, that's a, a really darn good option to have. And even behind him, I talked about it a lot with Davis Wenzel and, and his glove being completely solid at shortstop. Obviously has a lot of pop and, and works a lot of walks. The, the batting average isn't great, um, but you know he's got power. He can play shortstop. He can work a good at bat. It, that That's your fourth backup infielder? The depth of this team is in a really really good place. Now, the hope is that Ezekiel Duran and Josh Smith are not your starting shortstop and third baseman on opening day. That's the hope. But if the worst case scenario happens, and that is where you are as a team, you're not completely under fire. You're not completely underwater. You're not panicking and saying oh no this team is done this lineup needs Corey Seager in there there is nobody else that that can hit except for Corey Seager this isn't the Angels this isn't a one-star team this is an incredibly deep lineup that had five all-star hitters last year five of them so one of your all-stars goes down two of your all-stars go down well I guess they still have three all-stars in the freaking lineup they still have Adolis Garcia. They still have, you know, Marcus Simeon, a seven and a half war player who finished third in MVP voting. Yeah, it's not ideal to be without Corey Seager for any stretch of time. But even when the Rangers were without Corey Seager last year, they were still an incredibly dangerous team. I mean, it was what, two weeks into the season when Seager went down? It was very early on against the Royals. And this Rangers team just went on an absolute tear. And a large part of that was due to Ezekiel Duran being absolutely sensational in the first half of last season. Josh Smith, his overall numbers weren't that impressive, but I think the at-bats are still very quality. The power is showing a little bit more than I anticipated in games. It's still not going to be, you know, quite... It's not going to be Corey Seager. Neither of these guys are Corey Seager, and that's fine, and they don't have to be. But Ezekiel Duran, in the first half last year, had an 870 OPS in 260 plate appearances and 12 home runs. The guy was hitting over 300, but on base in the 340s, and, you know, he was a borderline all-star candidate last year. I think that really got overlooked of how incredibly good he was. Granted, in the first half, Leo Tavares was also a borderline all-star candidate. I mean, the Rangers, if not for everybody else on their team being so incredibly good, I think both of these guys had, both Zeke Duran and Leo Tavares, had a you know reasonable expectation that they could get some all-star votes and could be deserving of one of those final roster spots on the all-star team. Now, that didn't happen, um, and that would have been incredibly funny if the Rangers had not just six all-stars, but eight all-stars on their team, um, and none of them were Jacob deGrom. That would have been a hilarious place to be in, but that didn't happen. But this production was still there. Whether they got all-star votes or not, the number nine hitter in your lineup was Leo Tavares, who had around an 800 OPS in the first half and is your number nine hitter. And then the guy you plug in off the bench coming in with an 870 OPS and playing a really darn good shortstop defense. And then the guy behind him, Josh Smith, has a really good glove at shortstop, works fantastic at bats, and can get a little bit of pop in there every once in a while as well and play a million different positions. That is a lot of depth. That 
is one of the reasons why this team was able to sustain the injuries to Josh Young and to Jonah Heim and to Corey Seager and to Atolas Garcia last year. It's because there's a lot of guys that are good enough to start every day on a half-decent team. Zeke Duran and Josh Smith, those are both starting caliber players for a middle-of-the-road team, I think, and maybe could be better than that. But we're not really going to see all that much of it because right now they're utility players, and that is incredibly good value to get from your utility players of them being that good that you kind of want to start getting them some at-bats to be able to get some guys off their feet, to be able to get them some reps because they are still developing. And Zeke Duran is going to be 25 this year. Josh Smith is going to be 26 this year. They are young. They are good. And having them as peace of mind insurance, uh, uh, all-star insurance, you know, if your all-star goes down, that they're your insurance policy, that's a pretty darn good policy to have. It's why this team was so good last year. It's why this team will be so good this year. No matter what's happening with the starting rotation, yes, there's not nearly as much depth there or depth in the bullpen, but this starting lineup was one of the best in baseball last year. And even when the top guys are out, they have plenty of firepower coming off the bench to where you don't have to worry about any kind of injury insurance outside of some kind of catastrophe happening, which I'm not anticipating happening this year. Coming up, we're going to talk about the bullpen roles, what Bruce Bochy is saying about who is going to be the closer, and a little bit of talk about Anthony Rendon and his utter disdain for baseball, right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. You can bet on all your NBA favorites, including quick team, quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Or if you're thinking that Adolis Garcia is absolutely right, this team is absolutely going to win their second straight World Series title. You can bet on that at FanDuel, the World Series odds for the 2024 champion Rangers are at plus 1400 behind the Dodgers at plus 320 Braves plus 450 Astros at plus 700 and the Yankees at plus 800 those are some pretty solid odds for the Rangers going back to back as World Series champs just like Adoles Garcia knows is going to happen so go check it out visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot FanDuel official sportsbook partner of the NBA Shout out to the Everyday Rich for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day. On Thursday, shall we be back and talking about how Nathaniel Lowe is absolutely primed for a breakout season this year and why that's going to take this Raiders offense that's already incredible to the next level. Now, recently, Bruce Bochy was talking about some roles in the bullpen. The Rangers acquired a couple of new guys to their bullpen, David Robertson and also Kirby Yates. Both those guys have extensive experience as the closer, but they also have Jose LeClerc, the guy who closed out pretty much every game of these playoffs outside of the final game of the season where Josh Spores threw that beautiful curveball for called strike three to win the Rangers their first championship. But as of right now, even though the Rangers bullpen rules were very, 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 very well defined during that playoff run, it seems like they're not quite as well defined at this point in the season. Which was surprising to me. Bruce Bochy said there are no defined roles at this point. They are still trying to figure out who is going to pitch when and where and in what inning and in what capacity. There's going to be a lot of mixed matching of this bullpen, which is Bruce Bochy's strength. We saw him you know, take a little bit of time to figure things out during the regular season of who can be trusted in what spots is an entirely new team. It had been a hot minute since he had been a major league manager since 2019 so four years off and there was a new rule implemented about forcing batters or forcing pitchers to face at least a minimum of three batters if they are not getting out of the inning which threw a little bit of a monkey wrench into Bruce Bochy's plans because you know he was a mix and matcher he was a there are no loogies anymore in the bullpen lefty on lefty one out specialist that's not happening anymore because you have to face three hitters. And so that was a little bit of a wrinkle in the rules that it took some time to finagle this bullpen. And also the bullpen was just such a 
disaster fire last year. It, it just took some time to say, all right, who is not going to throw me under the bus? Who can get me one inning? And every single time, it felt like a wild predicament to ask a Rangers reliever to go one inning and not allow a run. It was just so messy last year. And I'm hoping that this year will be significantly less messy because it'd be hard to be even more messy than last year. It would just be hard to repeat how bad last year's bullpen was with a staff of, you know, six, seven, eight major league arms. Like, it's very difficult to be that bad and also win games. This team was so weird last year with having such a historically bad bullpen. Maybe this team can be slightly less weird this year in their bullpen usage, but not going with Jose Leclerc as the closer day one of camp saying, yeah, this guy who, you know, carry us to the championship, you know, three months ago. Yeah, that guy's still going to be the closer until something else happens. I thought that felt pretty obvious to say. I thought it felt like not as much like a a vote of disconfidence in, in Leclerc and, and not saying that he's the closer until proven otherwise. And I felt like that just made all the sense in the world to just go with the guy who literally just carried you for months. Give him that confidence in himself. Continue that confidence because obviously he's got to be riding a confidence high of, of you know being absolutely outstanding in the playoffs. The same with Josh Bores. Both of those guys have got to be feeling just on cloud nine, still a few months removed, of them just going nuclear in the playoffs and showing why, you know, it's not just that they have great stuff and and can't quite get it done in the big moments. They got it done in the biggest moments over and over and over again. And if not for that, and them suddenly finding the best stretch of their career at the time where the Rangers needed it the most, then this team isn't the World Series champs. It took a full bullpen revolution and three guys that you could trust in the back end for a month-long stretch. And the Rangers did it. And Josh Bores, Jose Leclerc, and Aroldis Chapman did it. And then they brought in some guys who you're hoping that you can trust, that have some veteran experience, that are hopefully going to be less of a tightrope act, a tight wire act of, you know, every pitch feels agonizing we never know if the strike zone is going to be hit or how many guys are going to be walked how many guys are going to be on base before the rangers either blow a late lead from the bullpen or narrowly escape but i thought that not naming jose the clerk was just a confusing move and it, it seemed like an obvious move to do but it kind of makes you scratch your head and either the rangers aren't so sure that that world series run is replicable from the clerk and from spores or they just feel really darn good about David Robertson and Kirby Yates. I think I would feel much more comfortable with the latter being true than them just not quite trusting that World Series run from LeClerc. I'm more inclined to believe that that was the real Jose LeClerc and that was the real Josh Spores. I'm more believing that uh, Jose LeClerc being amazing in 2024 is repeatable than I am that Josh Spores is going to be um very reliable and solid and not volatile like he's been in his whole career. But hey, the Rangers have some depth behind them, some depth options behind those guys. If what they did that month of October and one game in November isn't sustainable. And I'm feeling much better about that. There was some very important news that I am bearing the lead of maybe the most important news that I found out today. And it was from world series champion, Austin hedges. There was a lot of talk about Austin Hedges getting some buttless chaps, which all chaps are buttless. That's just kind of how chaps work. And wearing those chaps in the World Series parade, which you may remember, he was not wearing those chaps during the parade. It was the source of much consternation, much frustration. Is the only, well, there were a couple of things that didn't go perfectly about the parade, but it doesn't really matter because it's a championship parade. And that was fun um, because winning championships is fun. But we found out today thanks to intrepid reporting from Chris Rose on his podcast, talking with Hedges about why were you not wearing those chaps? You, you made a promise to Rangers Nation. You said you were going to wear the chaps. What what was the deal? And he said, well, I bought the chaps. It, it happened. I, I even got them. I was ready to wear them. But my mom said no. And that was the final card that said, well, I guess that's not happening. Because apparently they weren't just 
buttless chaps. They were also frontless chaps. So that would have been uh, a little traumatizing for the kiddos there at the parade. He wasn't quite sure what to do with those chaps that did not have a front. Not exactly appropriate for um, everyone around there. And he, he wouldn't want to get arrested for indecent exposure at a championship parade. I mean, that would be uh, kind of embarrassing. It would be hilarious, but also embarrassing, a little traumatizing for the kiddos. Um, but that is some some nice closure learning about that. And uh, just nice to hear some stories about the World Series champion Texas Rangers off elsewhere telling tales. Apparently, if he brings the Cleveland Guardians their first baseball championship since, I believe, the 1940s, apparently he has promised to wear the chaps for them, which feels a little rude, honestly. I know it's a longer drought for Cleveland and then the Rangers championship drought. It was, what, 53 years in Texas and 61 of the franchise. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric Nadell, for, for not remembering every single word of the lead-up of that call um, for the Rangers winning that championship. But still, Cleveland had won a championship before, and the Rangers as a franchise had not. So that just feels a little, a little rude, Austin Hedges. But hey, I'm still rooting for Austin Hedges. Maybe the Guardians. I don't think this is gonna. I think it's gonna be a moot point because you know the Rangers are going back to back. Maybe Austin Hedges can just show up at this parade and make up for his previous mistake. Maybe the Rangers will trade for him again at the deadline, give up some cash considerations or some international bonus pool money, and maybe at the 2024 championship parade, finally. We can get Austin Hedges breaking out those traps, but maybe wear something in front just so you don't get arrested at the championship parade. But that's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.